Hello and welcome to Crimes of Our Times Live. I'm your host, John Borowski, author and filmmaker. You may know me from my films such as H.H. Holmes, America's First Serial Killer, or John Wayne Gacy, Hunting a Predator. Today for my show, co-host is author, historian, Ken Lamaster, coming to us from Leavenworth, Kansas. Hi, Ken. Welcome. Hi. Uh, don't worry, folks. I'm on a work release program, so uh, we're all good. <laughs> you're you're on the outside, which is good. You were on the inside in a sense in the past, but now you're on the outside. <laughs> I, 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 did, I did life on the installment plan. You escaped. <laughs> yes. And they sent me a check to stay home. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Right. Um, and Ken, you've appeared in my film, Carl Panzer and the Spirit of Hatred and Vengeance, and you've also written books. Uh, these are phenomenal historical books and very interesting books. Uh, your Portraits of America, the Fort Leavenworth book, and then the Leavenworth Penitentiary. And, and I've actually done one on the city of Leavenworth, and the latest title is, is Leavenworth 7, The Deadly 1931 Prison Break. And, and it, it's it's been doing rather well the last year, so it's it's it, it's bought me a couple of cans of bacon and there's some bacon and beans there. Hey, that's awesome! You know, every, that's the thing. Everyone's interested in whether it's serial killers, crime, prisons, jails. You know, everybody's fascinated about that. So, thank you for being on. You know, and you were a senior officer specialist at Leavenworth Penitentiary from 1983 to 2010. What is a senior officer specialist and what was it like working there? Being a senior officer specialist with, with the Bureau of Prisons when I was there is you're almost like God of the, the, the institution. You're one step below a lieutenant and most of those guys, they all run the, the crucial jobs of running the number one officers in the cell houses, the main quarter center hall officer, control centers, rear gate, uh, they're in a lot of the high profile jobs that, that they don't let any of the rookies get a hold of. And then we get to pick on the rookies, you know, make sure that they get, that they get to learn. Well, I had a, I worked with a guy that started in like 1949. Uh, when I first started at the institution, he retired after 35 years. And I, you know, we always used to make a joke about that guy that, you know, he, he kicked the dog and, and, and slapped the cat on the way out the door when he went to work in the morning because man, he was tough. Wow. Well, but, but then, you know, I mean, you gotta be, and, and that's the thing, you know, I mean, I was going to save this question for later, but you know, I mean, people talk about Henry Lesser and what he did to reach Carl Panzram, you know, he was kind to him, but you know, even Panzram himself said, Hey, you know what? You shouldn't really walk in the cell alone. Because I'm like a tiger and you could be eaten. So, you know, I mean, how is that balance walked between, you know, pummeling them, you know, because, you know, they, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, punishment or versus, you know, you know, what else is there, right? One of the reasons why they come up with the, the federal prison service in, in its inception was because they had taken a look at other prisons throughout the United States and even into Canada and, they were looking at what they were seeing and, and, you know, the federal government decided, Hey, you know, we're paying these local jails and local prisons to house our guys. Let's go out and take a look at what's happening. Well, they started finding out that, you know, they were living in deplorable conditions. They, a lot of times the situations were we were paying for guys as taxpayers that had been dead for two or three years. So the federal government finally decided, Hey, you know what? We need to get this all under control and, put it all under one umbrella and they passed what was known as the three prisons act. And of course, you know, the government working like the government does, they pass a bill called the three prisons act and say, Oh, well, you know, we forgot to fund it. <laughs> so the fall, year, they decide to fund it, which means it's two years down the road before things get rolling. And in July of 1895, the United States penitentiary was born in Leavenworth, Kansas at the old military prison on Fort Leavenworth that had been operating for almost 25 years prior. And once the government got into that facility, they they kind of looked around and thought, you know, this is a great non-prison environment because, you know, we got a wooden wall and, and they started the limestone walls and putting up everything there. And they just, 
you know, in some places the wall was 40 feet. In some places the wall was maybe 15. So it, it wasn't really great for the confinement stage. So they decided they were going to build a new facility uh, and pass the money for it and started construction on the new facility, which is the current site of the, the U.S. penitentiary uh, in the spring of 1897. And the inmates would walk from the DB to the military, to the new uh, facility every day at sunrise and every night uh, back to the prison about one hour before the lights went out. So it, it, it was, yeah, it was seven days a week, 365 days a year. And under the most brutal conditions, it didn't matter if it was pouring down rain or you had three foot of snow, they were out there doing a job. And wow. they built the facility and it took, you know, from 1895 until probably into the early 1930s before it was totally done. The dome was on it. So, but they had moved the inmates inside the facility in 1904. Uh, they okay. moved part of the inmates over there into the facility and they were able to kind of house them and keep them under wraps there. So, and escapes weren't uncommon back then either. I mean, they some of the most ingenious things I've ever seen, you know, they're building sewer systems. So a guy crawls out through the sewer system, which has got to be. A real... well, that was raising Arizona, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I've been in the tunnels and in, in, in part of the sewer system and I wouldn't have crawled through it. And, you no, know, I mean, I could just imagine what you could get. <laughs> you know, I've seen, I've seen rats in the, in the tunnel system in that place that, that, that are, are bigger than the family pet. They, 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 yeah. They eat well. <laughs> Oof. Wow, that's brutal, yeah. But, you know, and then Ken Lamaster is also consultant on my latest book, Panzram at Leavenworth, which um, is really amazing. And it's a little heart. Well, there you can see it a little better. This picture was his first mug shot. And his last one, the last one was taken at Leavenworth, where he was executed. Um, you know, and let's talk about Panzram. So he was incarcerated at Leavenworth Penitentiary from February 1st, but he was also at Fort Leavenworth when he was younger. So, you know, interestingly enough, you know, one of his first incarcerations and his last right up the block at Leavenworth. Yeah, he, um, he was uh, sentenced for... Stealing from a um, quartermaster's depot in the military, and right, he joined the military at like seventeen, I think, underage, and then he tried. He stole a bunch of stuff, right? right? And and you know, the one picture of him, you know, that we can positively identify of him building the the west wall of the institution when they were putting the limestone into the into the wall at the old U.S. disciplinary barracks. So I mean, it's it's really kind of an interesting, you know, turnabout that, that he is here in the military and then he winds up the final place he winds up is, is three miles up the road. So, I know. So, you know, uh, you know, interesting. And, you know, his, his story, I mean, everything about it is so strange yet, you know, fascinating in those things. I mean, he was a bad guy, of course, but, you know, um, you know, so he was there at, at Leavenworth, Fort Leavenworth, and then Leavenworth. And what did you think of that book, The Killer Journal of Murder? The, you know, it, it, it's the perception of him. And at the time, his perception and details of how they treated inmates at that period of time in state facilities and in, you know, local jails and stuff was, was, was spot on. And, and like I said, that was one of the reasons why the Bureau of Prisons back then was a federal prison service had really kind of decided that they wanted to go to a, a more regimented type of, of habilitation instead of, you know, beating people from one end to the other. I mean, they would facilitate it if they had to, if they were pushed to the point to where, yeah. you know, it, 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 you know, we've got to control the situation. They would. Right. But. That was not their main. You know, that was not their main goal. When Leavenworth first opened up, they had programs, you know, right off the bat. They had education programs. They had religious programs. They had programs that no other institutions had. They did, you know, and and I'm glad you're saying that because that's very true. You know, 
Do you think that Carl Pantram killed the 22 that he said he did? You know, in some, in some instances, you sit there and you think to yourself, is that a figment of his imagination? Uh, is he looking at somebody else's crimes and, and putting himself in that perspective? But then again, you, you when you look at his writings and, and the the detail in which he gives in his his whole mindset of, you know, I hate the whole damn human race, including myself, and my only regret is I can't get my hands around its neck. You know, there's a lot of rage there. Oh. And you, when you when you come up with a person that's got that much rage, uh, I would say that he's probably pretty close to what he he says that he did. And and when he killed the laundry foreman here, uh, it was a brutal attack. I've got all of the inmate uh, statements and all the witness statements in his file, and, and I mean they all look at it and they're like, you know, wow, look at this. I mean. They were just as taken back as, as some of the correctional officers were. Uh, yeah, they were kind of shocked because that was kind of like uh, an unusual event where Panzram, after he murdered the laundry form in Warnke, he just went on a rampage because he wanted to kill the deputy warden who was at lunch, luckily, right? Right. <laughs> and he chased a guy by the name of a uh, correctional officer by the name of Lewis B. Gunther uh, through the institution in an area known as Two Gang Alley. And if you take a look at the institution, there's a central alleyway that runs right through the middle of the institution. And how it got its name, Two Gang Alley, was it took two teams of inmates shoveling coal 24 hours a day to keep the powerhouse powered. And that's how they come up with the name Two Gang Alley. And he chases Gunther down Two Gang Alley. Well, at that time frame, they have a, an east gate an inner uh, train chute at the East Gate, and Gunther stated during the court case that his goal was to try to get Panzram close enough to that tower to where the tower officer could shoot him and kill him. And Panzram, realizing the situation, knew what Gunther was trying to do. That's why he turned back and went back to the deputy warden's uh, building, which is building 63. It's a segregation building now, or back when I first started, we built a new resegregation building since I was there. And he surrendered saying, well, I guess I can't get anybody else. So here I am. Yeah, he really, he went on a rampage and, you know, he, um, you know, he really, you know, bashed in Warnke's, you know, head. And, and, you know, I have some of the autopsy results in the book, but like you're saying, so, you know, if, if anyone is a familiar or saw my film, you know, Panzer, I'm eventually wound up at, Leavenworth Penitentiary, but he was all while he was there, he was still writing his friend uh, Henry Lesser, who was a jail guard at the D.C. jail where he stayed. So that's where a lot of the correspondence, you know, comes into play. But what's so interesting, you know, as you're saying, you know, if anyone, you know, doubts, you know, those statements about what the federal penitentiary you know, what their aim was at the beginning. Here you have it in Panzram's words. Now, this is really interesting. You know, he says, um, you know, this is after the, after he murders, he's, you know, taking it easy. He's right in the jail guard. You know, he says here, um, I come here expecting to get more of the same kind of treatment, but determine that this time I won't get it for nothing. This time I am hostile and don't care what the consequences may be. This time I figure I'll beat them to it. I'll make one attempt to escape. I fail, but I don't get caught immediately. I begin getting all readied up and, and try again in another place. Because he was trying to get a job change so he could mm -hmm. easily escape from Leavenworth. You know, this guy wasn't dumb. He was, he oh. was pretty, he was highly intelligent for a six-year-old education. And you know, so he, his perception on, on his surroundings and his perception on the way, you know, when you take a look at it, and, and most people don't understand a correctional environment, where, you know, one of our one of our biggest training things is, is don't set a routine on a daily basis. Don't do the same thing every day because they have 24 hours a day, 365 days a year to watch you. And once they develop a sense of, well, he's going to go to the bathroom at six o'clock and then he's going to go down here and get himself a cup of coffee and then he's going to go do this. And he's, once they figure that out, 
they know how to circumvent your you and you know i used to go out i used to do i had inmates tell me that they never could figure out what i was doing because i'd be i'd go out and you know at odd times and i'd be standing around the cell house just kind of looking around like and if it was dark outside most inmates were kind of like what the hell is he doing and they didn't realize that what i was doing is i was looking at the reflection of everything going on in the cell house in the glass in the windows and i busted i busted you know a couple of gambling operations doing that and it had quite a bit of success and they were all kind of like we all thought you were just standing around picking your nose or something like, no. <laughs> <laughs> right you're aware but don't let them think you're aware right oh yeah <laughs> but you know this you know here he says here you know um you know, after he tried to escape, he didn't. He got caught, and then he murdered the, the laundry foreman, which, you know, he says he got into a, a small jam, you know, and he thought he was going to get another kicking around. So Panzeram says, to forestall, forestall all that, I grab myself a 10-pound iron bar and go on a warpath. Before I finish, I kill one man and try to kill a dozen more. Now... Here's the most interesting thing about this man's story. I mean, this really is the essence of this man's life and story. Um, after doing that, you know, I try to kill one man and try to kill a dozen more. After doing that, um, after doing all these things, I walk into a cell fully expecting to be chained up and beaten to death. But what happens? The exact reverse of that. No one lays a hand on me. No one abuses me in any way. This is how things have been for the past three or four months trying to figure it out. And I've come up with the conclusion that if in the beginning I had been treated as I am now, then there wouldn't have been quite so many people in this world that have been robbed, raped, and killed. And perhaps also very probably I wouldn't be where I am today. You know, and again, this is just human beings treating each other like human beings, whether you're a prisoner or an African-American. or it, It's across the board, and these issues keep coming up. One of the things that, and the warden at the time that Panzeram entered into um, Leavenworth was a, a man by the name of Thomas Bruce White. White had come up as a Texas Ranger. His yes. father was a county sheriff, and he actually lived in a house, and him and his brothers and his sister could look down into the jail and see everything that went on in the jail. And he developed his style after his father. And his father, pretty much his, his way of treating inmates was you treat them as human beings and you don't treat an inmate that's indigent any different than you treat an inmate who may be wealthy and doing time in jail. You treat them as equals. And that is how he lived his entire uh, career in, in law enforcement. He goes from a Texas Ranger to being a railroad detective to becoming one of the first FBI agents uh, ever in the Bureau of Investigations, and he was critical and, and instrumental in breaking the case of the Atlanta debacle where Warden Sartain wound up spending time in his own prison, and then he comes to Leavenworth during an investigation, and the whole time he's a deputy warden at Leavenworth, but he's also an active uh, FBI agent, and they make him the warden here, and his whole thing was is, is he, he told the officers you treat them like human beings you don't treat them like animals you don't beat them you don't you know that's not our job they're the punishment is being here it's it's not our job to punish them while they're here and, and that had started out in the very beginning with a lot of the wards that had been through before rw mclowry who you know was instrumental in the joliet prison uh mm -hmm there in Illinois and uh, a lot of them had brought in different programs as they come through as wardens. Uh, they had started a prison newspaper called the new era and, and yep. under Thomas Morgan. And uh, that was the longest running news institution newspaper in the history of the United States all the way up until the 1970s. And, yeah. you know, they were teaching inmates to read. They had one kid, uh, Dan Sose was brought into the institution as a 14 year old for murdering his two uncles and a sister who he thought were, were demons and he couldn't speak any type of English whatsoever. You look up his, his court case 
and they, they called him Nature Boy, and they bring him to Leavenworth, and being a 14 years old, the the inmates in the Catholic chapel grab him up and start teaching him how to uh, read and write English. They, you know, get him to the ways of the world, and he leaves the penitentiary at the age of 21, and he never went back to jail again. And that's just the way things were. And, and you know, when R.W. McLowry was here, and they were allowing inmates to start painting and, and expressing themselves the artwork and stuff, they had a, a guy do a portrait for the, the Catholic chapel uh, called, uh, called uh, This Man Receive a Sinners and Eats with Them. And it was a self-portrait. And, mm -hmm. I mean, the inmate actually writes a five-page letter to the warden and the deputy warden saying, hey, thank you for allowing me to do this and, and you know, keep me out of trouble. And, and, I mean, like we were talking earlier, they, they did all kinds of different programs. That's why, you know, Stroud had his aviary and, and they had in, institution beautification programs and, and, and where they had these big, massive, elaborate gardens and, and you know, shrubbery and, and flowers and trees. And even though you're in a 40 foot wall confinement, that, that they, that they, they weren't trying to, of, you know, we're going to thump you from sun up to sun down and, and beat you into submission. That was not their goal. Right. Exactly. Because a lot of the, at that time and before, and even after a lot of the state prisons and that Washington DC district jail, they were, you know, doing all these abuses and Panzram in his autobiography in that book, killer journal of murder, mm -hmm. he goes down the list. He's like, these are the places where I got whipped. Here's where I was electrocuted. Here are the people who did it. And I'll know them in hell when I see them. You know, it was like, geez, this guy, you know, and you see kind of, he was made, you know, he was this product that was made by hatred. And like you're saying, thankfully, you know, when the federal prison system came into be, you know, I mean, and there were still, you know, problems later with a lot of, wasn't the, uh, the Merton, the, was that Arkansas? That was a state prison, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Remember that whole debacle too? Yeah. And, you know, and that was like, wow, you know, I mean, just crazy that, you know, those things were actually happening. But again, when things go unchecked like that, you know. Now there, you know, when you go back and you take a look at that 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 era of corrections and jailing at that point in time, they didn't hire the brightest of the of the brightest or the or the best of the best. It was anybody that they could manage to, you know, here's a club, here's you know, yeah, here's the job, and and anybody gets out of line, you whack them upside the head and and go from there, and it, it's you know studying corrections for as long as I did and working in the career for 31 years. One of the things that, that, you know, when you take a look in the past and you sit there and you see, you know, if you, if you were a, a deserter, they, from the military, they, they branded you with a D on the forehead. If you were a thief, they branded you with a T. Uh, first of all, I can't imagine burning my fingers on most occasions and uh, getting branded right. on the forehead. Yeah, that's brutal. Well, but but, you know, it's also interesting, you know, because somebody would say, you know what, why are we why do you want why would we want to read about this guy? Why are we still put, putting books out like this? Well, you know, one of the things that he did when he was in Oregon, you know, you know, by the time he had his second or third abuse, when they hosed him down, mm -hmm. that reached the governor. And that's when they brought in the new warden, you know, so. Panzerham actually affected changes by his, you know, being incorrigible in a sense. And, and a lot of state penitentiaries after the Bureau had started laying its groundwork uh, into, yeah. you know, an education program and, and, and different programs and stuff instead of abusing inmates. There, there was a lot of prison reform groups, uh, Maude Ballington Booth and, and you know, they called her the little mother because she would go around the United States uh, touring facilities and giving them ideas of, of how to work things. And, you know, how do you, you know, why do you let your officers walk around here and just thump somebody for, you know, just the little, the smallest of things. And, and, and it started coming under a lot of press. And once the press started getting involved and, and throwing all this stuff out there, you know, everybody's kind of like, hey, we better change our, our, our mode of operandi or we're really going to, you know, set things back. And, and 
R. W. McClowry, the second warden of Leavenworth, is probably one of the biggest innovators, and there's a book out there about him uh, called Forgotten Reformer, R. W. McClowry. And McClowry is the guy who introduced uh, first the Bertillion measurement system as an inmate identification system, and then he goes out and goes on a limb and says, hey, why don't we uh, start fingerprinting everybody? Because he met uh, Kenneth John Ferrier at the uh, World's Fair in St. Louis with a Scotland Yard display on fingerprinting as the new wave of identification. And he opened up the, the Bureau of Criminal Identification at Leavenworth and started fingerprinting and, and teaching the whole Midwest and Western part of the United States the uh, art of fingerprinting and identification. So, I'm, and a lot of these state penitentiaries started getting into the program and thinking, hey, you know, maybe we need to change the way we do things. And, and you know, we can't just stick a guy in a hole and, and think maybe in 20 years he's going to come out. You, you, you know, you stick somebody in a dark hole for 20 years and feeding bread and water uh, about every third day. I'm pretty darn for sure that he's not going to be the most pleasant human being out there you know. or or as Panzeram says when you're in the hole for that long the milk of human kindness curdles after so long <laughs> no, I, I, I can imagine I mean, it, it, like, you know, and, and I've seen some guys that that you know I've come across some guys in my career that I, I think that uh, if they had to been caught in time they would have probably wound up being as big a serial killers as, as Panzeram or even worse Right. Uh, and, and, you know, we talk about, you know, the employees at Leavenworth, but, you know, when we look back, we go back and we say, okay, you know, Panzeram, when he walked through the door, he sat down with Warden White, I guess, you know, I don't know if that's at that time period, they would sit down either with the warden or the deputy and talk to them or whatever, right? That was actually, that was actually in the protocol when an inmate showed up to the institution, he was to have a, a meeting right off the bat with the deputy warden. If the deputy warden wasn't available, then an institution captain operating as the deputy warden would give the the spiel about, you know, this is what is expected of you. Here's the rule book. You know, they would take them down to the barber shop and get their head shaved and give them their uniforms. And, and, and you know, in some of the old facilities, <laughs> you would you'd walk in and, and you'd have a pocket watch or anything of value. Well, you could kiss that goodbye because it either went home with somebody else or it went home with, you know, it went in the trash. Well, here in one of the buildings in the basement, and it's the laundry building, oddly enough, there's, a, there's I finally figured out what this was. There's a room down there. It's marked vault. And in my, my study for uh, the book uh, 11 or seven, I discover what the vault is. The vault is where they stored all the inmate valuables that came in with the inmates and they were stored there until the inmate left and they were given back to them. So it, it, it's, you know, it, they started taking a little bit different approach with their, you know, we're going to treat you like a human being until you want to prove that you're not a human being. Right. And right. a lot of guys yeah. really, you know, it, it, the, the overall overwhelming response in that era was, you know, the same thing that Panzram had, you know, maybe if I would have been treated like this, you know, when I was younger, I wouldn't be here today. Right. Because that rage and that hate oh, may yeah. not have built from being treated because again, what did they say? You know, the job of the corrections officer, you know, like you were saying earlier, it's, it's to, you know, reform or to be there for them, not to abuse and, you know, you know, hurt them more, but weren't he, you know, I mean, you know, and again, we get these bad seeds or bad eggs somewhere, you know, and, you know, when you read Killer, a journal of murder, you know, they talk, you know, well, you know, Panzeram went on a rampage and he killed the laundry foreman. Well, you know, the facts are when Panzeram stepped through those doors, what did he tell Warden White? I'll kill the first guy that messes with me. First thing out of his mouth. And he wasn't kidding. Right. So then, you know, when I did my research and, um, Charles Wharton's book, House of Whispering Hate, like you said, is one of the most right. what, authentic books, right, on Leavenworth? Well, one of the most th amazing things about that book um, is you can actually sit down, and the National Archives here in Kansas City is the, is where the uh, inmate files are, are held from inmate number one till the ascension of every year 
uh, on their 65th anniversary of the files. And I've sat down and, and I even actually took a Xerox copy of that book one time from the National Archives because there are certain places in here where he identifies individuals by number only. Right. And, and I was looking at, at their files and realizing that, you know, they are right down to the, the you know, he's – He's got where they live in the book and in this file that says exactly where they live and it's exactly where they were in the book, where they worked. You know, you know some of the things that they did while they were, it's all there in their files. And it's it's, it's like, you know, it, it's one of the, probably the best books written about the institution. Um, so, and by the way, if any of you all ever find one in a garage sale, please keep me in mind because the average cost of that book is about $500. Uh, yeah. So if you find yeah, it's, if you find a print for two dollars and fifty cents, I'll pay the postage and get it here. <laughs> it's a great book, you know, and and that was crucial to my researches for the Panzram film, and for my book Panzram at Leavenworth, you know, because when you start, you know, when I started to research, you know, you know, whoever Warnke was, the facts are that mul numerous inmates said that he was making fun of Panzram about his moral habits. We all know what Panzram was doing with young men and stuff. So, sure. you know, and supposedly that got on Panzram's nerves and that's why he said, hey, you know, and he probably warned him. But then what happened, Panzram was caught by Warnke when Panzram was bleaching handkerchiefs and he was written up. So, you know, talk to us about what happened in that series of events, you know, because usually, you you had told me, and I didn't know this, that you know the prisoner is written up for an offense, then they're taken before the deputy warden or warden the next day or several days later to plead their case mm -hmm. or whatever. But you know, we'll talk about that. But number one, you know, did Warnke have to, you know, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Did he have to really report him? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe he was just being an a-hole. So, you know, all these things that Wernke do, was doing, of course, he didn't deserve to die. We know that. Right. But there's proof from multiple sources that he was, every day, sticking at the Panzeram, and Panzeram just got sick of it. Talk a little bit about those, what happened in those series of events, like, you know, when Panzeram was bleaching and why he got caught. What? Why would he get in trouble for bleaching handkerchiefs? Well, in an institution environment, uh, bleach, for one, is a controlled substance, a controlled item, and it's because of its corrosive nature. If you take bleach, you can actually, you know, get it to the point where it'll start uh, deteriorating bars, it'll deteriorate concrete, um, and it, it you can make haste with an escape. So I'm not exactly sure, you, you know, nobody knows exactly the reason why Warnke had really got into him about bleaching uh handkerchiefs or not, but, you know, one can surmise that, you know, he knew of Panzram's previous attempts to es escape, and maybe that was part of the reason, you know, God only knows. I mean, we don't know for sure, um, but once he wrote him up and the paperwork gets forwarded to the deputy warden's office, well, the deputy warden's office is like 25 yards across a little grass berm from the laundry building. So it's, it's right there. And Panzram had been in trouble before for trading cigarettes and, and stuff like that. So it's kind of like he's already been down this road a little bit before. And while the punishment wasn't most of the time harsh, uh, if, if you continue to escalate, then the time of whatever happens escalates over time. And, you know, he's probably looking at the fact that, you know, well, if I get caught doing this, uh, they they think I was trying to escape or they know I was trying to escape. Then, you know, I got caught dealing cigarettes for candy and, and stuff like this. And then uh, now I'm in it for bleach. And that's a that, that's an escape tool if I needed it to be. Uh, he's probably thinking, you, you know, he's probably looking in his mind at that point in time that, you know, Somewhere along the line, they're going to take me out back to the whipping post or, or they're going to waterboard me or they're going to beat me to, you know, the cows come home or whatever. And that probably escalated his his frame of mind. And, you know, if you think about it, when you when he started out at the Minnesota School for Boys at Red Wing, which, you know, 
I've read into their history too, and it was probably one of the most brutal places on, on God's green earth. And, and, you know, you start there as a child and you grow into adulthood through your thir- through your 20s and your 30s. And, and every stop you, you go, the torture's more intense and, and whatever, you know, you've got to think about, yeah, that is on his mind, but also what kind of PTSD does that leave on an individual? Um, and that was one of the things that, that back then, you know, PTSD was not a known, you know, was not a known illness. It was not a known factor in people's lives. And it was just kind of one of those that, because that was a generation of, you know, hey, buddy, buck it up and then live with the consequences. Well, you know, here you've got a guy that's been a pent up rage for, for 25, 30 years. And now he's getting back into a corner. Well, in, in certain situations, you back people into a corner, they're going to come out swinging. And yeah, and that's, probably, that's what happened. Probably what happened. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and right. I mean, you know, there's so many different angles to look at it. And, you know, we weren't there, you know, and it's right. always interesting. But it, that's why it's interesting to, you know, talk about these cases, you know, and, and you know, you see, you know, you know, discuss, okay, you know, you're an expert there. And then we have the writings from other people and we try and piece it together, you know, but then, so like Panzeram said, Hey, he was just, he was taken to, you know, segregation and he was given a great dinner and he was treated great, but talk about who was also in there across from him that had two whole cells to himself. Well, Robert Stroud and Stroud, the Birdman of Leavenworth, not Alcatraz, because right. he didn't have the birds at Alcatraz. Right. And, <laughs> you know, everybody's impression of Robert Stroud is the, the, uh, the movie. Yeah. The, 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 the fictional movie Birdman of Alcatraz. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, when you when you finally get into the idea of reading into the, the, the life of Robert Stroud and when you realize that, you know, when he gets to Leavenworth, he, he weighs 95 pounds soaking wet. He's only like five foot four, five foot five, and he's got this <laughs> terrific delusion of grandeur that he's running something at Leavenworth. And Stroud is just—he's a malefactor from the word go. It, he, you know, he was assigned to, to clean up the showers, you know, during the showers, and then he's rode up for for exploitation in the showers, and and he's he's. You know, in 1914, he's inside the dining room and, and, you know, you take a guy that's 95 pounds soaking wet in the movie. It's his mother. It's always his mother in the movie. It's always the mother in the movies. You know, it's mom. Yes, yes. Well, in all actuality, it was his brother, Marcus, and it came from Kansas City to see him. And it was late in the day. And they told him that, you know, they're at the movies. We're not going to go down and look for him. Uh, if you want to leave him something, you can come back tomorrow and, and whatever. So he leaves him all this candy and, and, and stuff. Well, Stroud, being the individual that Stroud is, you know, 95 pounds soaking wet, eats everything, eats everything his brother gives him. And, and then they take him down to the dining room where at that period of time, the dining room, you're all sitting facing one direction. Uh, you, the rules are you can't take. They, they didn't, you know, they, they just didn't put you through a line and slop stuff on your plates. You know, you took what you felt like you could eat, and your job was is if you take it, you eat it. And if you wanted more, you know, they had hand signals. If you needed, you, you know, I've seen it described as if you needed meat, you held your fork up. If you needed something to drink, you held your cup up. If you needed to do whatever, you know, and, and there was no talking in the dining room. Well, Stroud is... is babbling on like an idiot and this is this this is coming from inmates perspectives not only correctional officers perspectives he's just babbling like an idiot and and turner walks over to stroud and looks at him and says number and that's all they would say to inmates back then when they wanted to know who you were it was not who are you what's your name and number it was number and stroud being the, the 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 kind of individual that he was Thought, well, okay. And then overnight, the inmates are playing with Stroud saying, you know, hey, Turner's a head buster. He's going to be, you know, coming down hard on you tomorrow. And you're not going to get to see your brother. And you're, and Stroud's got all this going through his head. 
And the next afternoon, you know, during the afternoon meal, he asked to go to the bathroom and walks up into the aisle and starts approaching Turner. And he hollers, did you shoot me? Which means, did you write me a shot? And a report, you know, for doing something wrong. And, you know, Turner tells him to sit down. And he keeps coming and he says, I ask a man a question. I want an answer. Did you shoot me? And he pulls a five inch case knife out of his uh, coat pocket. And I mean, hits Turner right dead square of the lower half of the chest and severs the lower, the lower artery in the heart and kills him instantly. And the movie portrays Turner as a disgruntled old correctional officer. Well, in all actuality, uh, Turner at the time of his death is 28 years old and he's got two kids and a wife at home and, wow. and his wife actually dies in the early 1960s. Mm -hmm. uh, she runs a boarding house for the remainder of her life for uh, single correctional officers. And that's how she wound up making her living and the kids were raised and, and stuff like that. Well, you know, Stroud just becomes such a, a, he just becomes an individual that, that he, nobody liked him. The inmates didn't even like him. You well, know? his, his, his priority was to cause problems. Right. right. And he was in the public eye with the birds. So right. like when Panzeram was across from him, supposedly, and again, you know, I don't know how much you could believe Stroud, maybe a, a small percentage, but Stroud wants the attention too. Right. right. You know, so I don't know how much, you know, like he said, you know, certain things about the execution. He wasn't there and he didn't see it. He probably heard it secondhand, like you had told me. Sure. You know, but it's like Stroud had this ego and thought, like you said, he ran the place and would he would purposely want to cause problems. Like supposedly he said he yelled out the Panzeram across the cell. Hey, you know, we'll get you a, uh, you know, a razor so you could try right. and kill yourself. So, you know, the law won't get you, you know, but Panzeram didn't care. He would just want to be out of this world. So, you know. Yeah, because did try to commit suicide yeah. while he was being held over for execution. And Stroud was just kind of one of those that he he was just he was just a malcontent from the word go. And he's one of those individuals I think he would have probably been a serial killer. Well, uh, and like you said, you know, in these movies, that's the other thing, right? Hollywood versus, you know, uh, reality or the right. investigative versus, you know, what the news reports. And I've learned that they're two different things. Like you had told me, you know, Stroud many times was in his, the cells naked and there was bird crap everywhere. But in the movie, of course, you see Burt Lancaster clean as a whistle. It's always right. Well, well, according to some of the correctional officers I talked to when Stroud was at Springfield, when the movie Birdman of Alcatraz came out, Burt Lancaster had actually gone down to meet with Stroud and the meeting lasted less than five minutes. And he came out of the, he came out of Springfield and told his publicist, you know, I'm never going to talk about this movie again. Don't ever, you know, it, and part of his, you know, all of the celebrities have the do's and don'ts of what to ask me, you know, and stuff like that. And, and part of the don'ts is don't ask me about the movie, the Birdman of Alcatraz because Stroud had really bugged Lancaster out to the point where I don't even want to talk about this guy. Wow. And, and Stroud, you know, Stroud never taught himself how to speak German. Stroud's uh, digest of, of bird diseases was actually a plagiarization of a book from France that was written two years prior. Wow. And his, his scientific studies included uh, feeding birds gasoline, uh, plucking all their feathers out to see if they could live and how long. And most of what he he did under the guise of scientific research back then would now be called animal cruelty today. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, many people don't know the true Robert Stroud, you know. Yeah, he, he I I knew some correctional officers that, that were here that knew Stroud before he went to Alcatraz in, in the early 40s and in even when he came back through here when he was on his way to Springfield and they were just, he said he was, all of them had the impression that the same thing. And I mean, they were, you're talking guys that have worked different decades in the facility. were having the same process of uh, uh, thought process of, you know, this guy's the scourge of the earth. Mm -hmm. He's not anything like what he's portrayed to be. 
And, and I mean, it, he's <laughs> it, he's quite an individual. And I mean, you know, when when you sit there and you, you you boast that you know my death is going to be front page news all over the world, and the only reason why it didn't make front page news, or well, I know the reason why, but they, they, they I've seen stories written that say. Well, the only reason Stroud's death didn't make worldwide breaking news was JFK was assassinated the same day. And it's kind of like, I'm pretty darn for sure that Stroud's death would have been on the back page of every newspaper in the world. And, and probably one of the most interesting articles I've ever read about Stroud was in an old saga magazine from the 1960s where he talks about my 53 years in prison. I have that. I mean, you may have sent that to me. I found that recently when I was going through my Panzram stuff. That's phenomenal. And, and his his whole, you, you know, talking about the Turner murder, and he's he's talking about, you know, at any second, all of the inmates were sitting on the end of their seats, waiting for me to give the signal to tear up the institution and kill everybody. He's so full of BS. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, so I mean, you know, even when you read the little part in Panzram at Leavenworth that he writes about Panzram, it's all about Stroud. It's not right. about Panzram. It's about right. well, here's what I told him to do. Here's what you know I heard him do. Here's what yeah. he said to me. It's like, dude, and you know, even Panzram said, look, I didn't even want to talk to this guy. He didn't Panzram didn't even mention him by name. Panzram said, Yeah, there was someone here <laughs> that wanted to be cordial. <laughs> but I didn't want to listen to him. Well, I well, love it that Panzram didn't give him his spotlight. You know what I mean, right? Yeah, because in, in that moment in the Birdman of Alcatraz, when, when Bert Lancaster's talking to Telly Savalas, and, and Telly Savalas is the, the, the Panzram character, right. you know, yep. it, it's kind of like, you know, they're portraying, you know, Telly Savalas is, is portraying Panzram as the lunatic and, and right. being portrayed as the... the, the <laughs> what a mentor or whatever right yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous but but let's talk about you know what i uh, many interesting things about this case and another interesting thing was that panzeram received the death sentence at a time when the death sentence was not in effect in kansas correct the first execution at leavenworth uh it was it, his was the first execution at leavenworth but the death penalty was abolished in 1907 it, it, so they did it for him. And the the difference being is, is they can abolish it in a state, but you can still do it on federal on federal property. Um, because I think if I remember right, I think Indiana doesn't have the death penalty anymore, but we have the death house there at Terre Haute, Indiana now. And there's, you know, there's four inmates that are destined to die by lethal injection in Terre Haute here in the next few weeks, I believe it is, if I remember right. And, and as long as it's on federal land, there's no jurisprudence of the state and, and the, the laws are different. So, and I mean, you know, one of the most interesting things about the, the, the movie where uh, James Woods portrays Carl Panzeram is when, you know, in the courtroom scene where they ask him if he had any final words and he says, you're the guys that created me. You're the ones that will have to destroy me. You, you know, when you read his, his biography and you read some of his words and stuff like that, it, it's and it's in the court case. So, I mean, it, it's like, you know, he's kind of a, you know, James Wood, I, I think, probably portrayed Panzeram pretty well, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, certainly in the documentary, the the, the young man that portrayed him and in, in, I, I think did an excellent job in, in the documentary. I may be a little biased because, you know, you know <laughs> you're in it. <laughs> there's a guy that looks like me in the, in the documentary. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, you know. Well, when, when Panzerim would write about it, you know, he would write as if he death was his, you know, uh, you know, future partner saying that he was courting death and he said he wants it. And he said, when the time comes, you know, he'll gladly, you know, spit in the captain's eye and run up there. Everything he said he did, he wanted to do, he did. He spit in the captain of the guard's eye. He led the guards, you know, almost they were he was dragging the guards up there he yeah, just he, wanted to be out of it you know he he and and when he gets at the top of the you know stairs and you know and he tells people he tells the people there in the courtyard you know they tell me that uh when i hit the end of this rope i'm gonna crap my pants and and you know my only resolve is that i can't you know 
stand up here butt naked and crap all over you. You know. you know, not many people know about that. And that here's the interesting thing. And, you know, we got like 10 minutes, but the whole Panzram's last words, you know, we'll never know. Stroud said, he he says, hurry it up, you cocksucker, whatever. The yeah. book killer, a journal of murder says, hurry it up, you Hoosier bastard. I could right. hang a dozen men while you're fooling around. But the hangman wasn't even from Indiana. So yeah. these things don't make sense. Then the press reports say that Panzram didn't say a word yeah. when he got up there. So, and then now here, Tom White, I thought Tom White was very interesting. This was from... Tom White, The Life of a Lawman, and it's in my book on Panzram at Leavenworth. This is what he says, Panzram says, which is very interesting. As he stood on the platform, waiting for the hood and noose to be adjusted, he glared at the physician and other officials and witnesses and muttered, all right, you sons of bitches, you've come to see a show, and now you're going to see it. They tell me when I drop down there and hit the end of this rope, I'll crap my pants. I just wish I could take them off so I could crap all over you dirty bastards. Right, but that sounds right. Like he would say that. I could see that. I could see him saying that. And you, you know, it, it's the the personality of what you see in his writings fit more to that than they fit anything right. else. And yeah. the only thing I would like to know is, is you know, the Leavenworth Times and other newspaper articles that I've wrote or read uh, on his case talks about a plane flying overhead. And that, you know, some accounts say that they were taken, that they were taken um, photos, pictures. but there's also accounts that say that there was video shot, uh, you know, that they were kind of doing homemade videos at that point in time. Wow. You, you know, what would that, what kind of find would that be in somebody's attic? That would be amazing. And it might be because like you said, there was a plane flying over and, you know, uh, it, it's, you know, like you said, but I thought it was interesting that they never had an execution there at Leavenworth. So they had to build the gallows. But to me, it's like, you know, Wharton talks about that in Panzer. I'm, I'm sure like day after day, it must have been just like unnerving to hear that building it and putting it together and seeing it yeah. take shape, you know? The, 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 I've got a picture of the Kansas State gallows uh, where they hung Hickok and Smith and they, in the end cold blood murders yeah. and, and several other inmates and you know, they they look a little bit like what you see in, in Western movies and, and stuff like that, but they're 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 quite an operation on their own. And and you know, when you figure out that two days before they execute an individual, they actually go in and weigh them because it, it, it does make a difference that that you know that the, the rope is <laughs> you tie it to head. the head comes off and, and and you know certain things happen and. and they, they go in and weigh the individual and then they go out and, and take sandbags and, and, and get them to the exact weight of the individual and drop them. You know, I can't imagine sitting in a, in a, in a cell listening to them, you, you know, <laughs> it's going to be me. awful. Well, and you know, they're probably kidding around and stuff because that's how it is. You know, when I, you know, I'm sure police officers, you know, people don't realize that, you know, when officials do that, it's, that's how they deal with it because it is so deep, you know, I mean, oh. And one of the things I always tell people about people in, in my line of work and people in, in, in law enforcement and, and even people in the military and people in, in, in the medical field, our sense of humor tends to be a little bit different than everybody else's. Uh, and it's not that we're mean and cruel and, and despicable human beings. It's just that, you know, when you see, you know, over the course of my career, uh the first 24 months at Leavenworth from 83 to 70, 85, 83 to 85, we had 18 homicides in 24 months. Wow. And we're talking about, you know, some of the most brutal killings that, that you would ever want to see. And I'd, I'd already seen uh, a couple when I was out at the state penitentiary at Lansing while I was there. And, and some of the things that you see on a daily basis, I mean, uh, we had a guy, uh, beat a guy into submission for oral sex and the guy started doing the job and over the course bit it off. And oh. I mean, you know, when that happened, that had actually been the second time in my career and I'd actually seen that and everybody's standing there screaming, you know, we got to grab this guy, grab this guy, grab this guy. And it's kind of like three, two, one, boosh, the guy falls over. 
And it's like, you know, it, it sounds cruel to, to do a countdown, but when you're standing there and this guy's bleeding, if you start grabbing this guy, all it's going to do is escalate the situation and he's mm-hmm. going to more. Right. And, and, and I mean, you, you're almost kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. So it's, it's, it's like, you know, the whole, the whole thing you see inside of prisons and inside law enforcement and, 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 and an emergency room and a hospital and stuff like that. The, the normal human being doesn't see that. And they, and they don't, uh, they, 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 most people wouldn't know how to, to function in that situation. And I mean, I was, I was part of the initial investigation into a drug kingpin out of Oakland, California's murder. And I, I'm the one that stripped him from, and bagged his clothes for evidence. I'm the one that counted the, the stab wounds. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, when I got to the hospital, the outside hospital where we took him, they took everybody's blood pressure because they needed somebody to go into the operating room with him. And I'm the only person in the, in, in the whole place that had a, a normal blood pressure. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And, and that's what, you know, people just kept, you know, they can't fathom about that, but you know, let's, you know, your books, where could people get these? They're on Amazon. Is that the best place for your book? Uh, they, they're on Amazon. Mm-hmm. They're on uh, Arcadia Publishing's website. Uh, they can also look on Facebook under uh, Leavenworth 7, the, 19, the deadly 1931 prison break. I've got a Facebook page dedicated to that book. And that's your latest, right? That's my latest. My yes. latest and greatest uh, achievement to the, the, yeah. the world. And hey, you know, you're you're giving, this is, you know, us, you know, crime fans and, you know, everybody, and this is historical, you know, so you're doing a great thing. You're taking your knowledge of these, you know, institutions and sharing them, you know, and this is great, you know, and I thank you for that. Now, what do you work? Can you talk about, are you working on anything now or what's up next or a little? Tequila? I'm doing some preliminary investigative work into a local case for a missing teen that has been missing for over 30 years by the name of Randy Leach and, the, the situations that have occurred. I mean, there's lots of backstories, lots of, uh, you know, this was a cover up or this was, you know, satanic or, or, you know, this was this and this was that. And it's, 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 it's kind of a hard thing to decipher because there's so many angles to this story. And of course, you know, COVID-19 and, and, uh, I tell everybody that, that you know, I've undergone testing for cancer, you know, over the course of this and everything's fine folks. Um, but it's kind of one of those things, you know, I tell people I've got the C's covered. I'm ready to move on to the D's. and, the e's and the and- <laughs> Well, that's how I feel. You know, as you get a little older, it's each, each year, right. You're getting, you got to do this. Okay. This pops up. You got to get checked for that. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've had, I, I, I've had more, uh, uh, you know, I feel like Dracula's victim because I've had more blood drawn from me in the last six months than I've had in the last 60 years. It's like, you know, I feel like, you know, should I be sitting there? What do you know? Let me get that for you. Uh, <laughs> well, and you're also available, right? For any filmmakers or oh, yeah. authors, you're available to be interviewed about your extensive history of, you know, the prison system and love. I've work. actually done work with, with like Alan Jacobson on inmate 1577. Yeah. Uh, setting the backstory for uh, Alcatraz, his character uh, being in Leavenworth and an Alcatraz. I've done, uh, some work with uh, the television series Chicago PD on the episode where uh, they send one of their undercover officers into the, the MCC Chicago right. uh, episode. And, and I've done, you know, histories detectives with PBS and different things like that. And they have had, you know, great reviews over it and, and had a great time doing it. I mean, it's, it, you know, working with you in the past and, 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 yeah currently working with you and stuff like that's always been a great experience and, and you know some of the other podcasts that i've done and and uh, it's always been a blast to do yeah it's always it's always you know it's always you know great to have knowledgeable people that have experienced it ken lamaster as we wrap it up you could find his books penitentiary love and worth on amazon and check him out on facebook ken lamaster if anyone wants to interview ken hit him up on facebook he's available to be interviewed um but yeah thanks everybody for joining us now next thank you ken for being on the show i really appreciate it absolutely thanks for having me and look to work look forward to working with you in the future and i want to 
that they, they just announced that they're going to build a new Leavenworth here. Yeah. Uh, so when they close the old one, I expect you to come and I'll take you on the grand tour of the old facility and you'll finally get to see the inside of the laundry building. Oh, I'd love to. That'd be great. Thank you. Ken. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and also up next, join us next week, which Joel Goodman will be on a show talking about Henry Lesser and Carl Panzram's relationship. And check out next up is Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBT. Thank you, Ken. Take care. Absolutely, buddy. Have a good one. You too. Thank you.